you should raise your hand and you know make a request. But in that same spirit, we're going to plan what hymns we're going to sing together. So if you have any hymns, uh, please see me today. That you, uh, hymns that you'd like to sing, tell me which ones you'd like to sing and maybe why, and we'll have a little blurb about, you know, this is one that Tony would like to sing, and it's because it was whatever, you know, whatever reason. So um, anyway, that's what's going to happen with the hymn scene. So talk to me today if you have ideas for that. So, and also, I have a request since we have time. Um, when you leave, if you put a, a hymnal on the floor, which happens every Sunday, please pick it up and put it on a chair. Thank you so much. Let me check on our teachers. We ended a little early. Question? Yeah. What passage were we on last week? Luke? Luke 7. Luke 7. Luke 7. Luke 7. Yeah, temptation. Do you mind if I just read what I think he might be teaching on? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, because he ended with. Um, pardon? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to read from uh, Luke 17 5, and just I think that's kind of where he's going to be. Or would someone else like to read? Would anyone else, else like to read the passage? Kathy, how about you start with okay. Luke 17, 5? 17, 5? Yeah. How far you want? How far Let's you go want through, through 10. Okay, through 10? Yeah. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. And here he comes. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, he ended early. Quickly. Good morning, everybody. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. Were you already there? Yeah, she just read it. Good. What verses did you read? Joe asked me to. Yep. <laughs> That's fine. See, we read um, verses 5 through 10. Perfect. Perfect. What I. What I think will be useful here, especially in verses um, five through six, is it will help us. What we'll do is kind of reflect back on the first four verses as we think about this. And, you know, sometimes our our headings chop up parts of the scripture that just almost keep us from seeing it in context. So I think that's something we mentally just want to watch out for is when we see a verse, sometimes we're like, what could this mean? And we don't, I, I don't always start a chapter before, right? Or at least a verse before, because the context of the disciples question is, is so uh, interesting in how important their not question, sorry, their request, increase our faith. It might be tempting for us to think that verses three and four are easy to do. Huh. It might be, right? It's, it's almost like it's an academic practice. Oh, if somebody sins, point it out to them. But then if somebody said, hey, Think you should go and talk to this person 
well, well, it's not that big of a deal. You know what? I've already forgiven it. It's over. It's been a week. I'm not going to bring it up. Right? I've done that. I've, I've thought, oh, I, boy, going to them and talking to them about this sin is going to be uncomfortable. And I don't want to, I don't want to do that. And that I think is, is maybe why the apostles are taken aback or when he says, forgive him. And even seven times in the day, forgive him. The apostles go, oh, well, you know, and especially we could say, yep, I'm going to forgive five times a day. But how about that fifth time? How are you feeling? Right at the moment, you're like, oh, I'm exasperated by the way someone keeps bothering me, keeps offending me. Keeps and then you know sinning. What about real sin? Not just they annoyed me. We're talking about a sin that someone commits against us and and repents and asks for forgiveness. So increase our faith. Um, <clears throat> Phil Riken, uh says like that might be the the one of those moments where the apostles really got it right. You know, like they they didn't always get it. But here, what's neat is it goes back to our faith. What is the essence of our faith? Usually what we'll do, and, and this is a good answer, but we'll say the gospel. The gospel is the essence of our faith. Absolutely true. So if that is the case, that speaks into trying to be reconciled to each other and trying to talk about actual sin, talking about actual repentance, and actual forgiveness because we do a poor job at that as living in the flesh we we don't do it well our apologies our repentance is mixed in with well hindsight is 2020 so yeah if i could have done it again i would have done it differently that doesn't sound like repentance does it in, in biblical terms what well, when i think of repentance i think about the publican who says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I think that is the, the, the phrase that I think depicts forgiveness or sorry, repentance so well, because there's no excuse. There's no conditions. There's no um, kind of excusing myself as I ask for forgiveness. And we're better at this probably with maybe facing God because we see God as a holy righteous person and we know i think we've been taught don't repent to god with any of your own works in your hands mm -hmm. but when i go to you i don't always think about that offense the same way um and i think we would be better served with each other if we went to each other saying the same kind of thing please have mercy on me mm -hmm. i I'm a sinner. I sinned against you. Um, the way that I acted is my fault. And I, and if I could just stop there <laughs> and not go back to, let me, let me give you the backstory. <laughs> yeah. So I think that is why we need an increased faith that's truly based on on grace and not self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is deadly, right? It's it's against uh, Christ's righteousness. So I want to kind of think about how that request increase our faith. What does it mean to ask for increased faith? And then how does that increased faith inform how we would go to a friend or a brother or sister um, and talk about the sin that we see happening that we're a part of or that that they're they're committing and then to go through the next steps of repentance and forgiveness and and really trying to do it without making it a humanistic kind of forgiveness 
um, there's, there's almost no way I can forget a sin in my own flesh, in my own human way. How do I move past that? Even if I have consequences that will take place, which is okay. There's consequences. There can be discipline. There can be a, a slight change in, in your relationship. Maybe there's not much trust in terms of what you're going to do in the future, right? If you have a business partner that things don't go well with, doesn't mean you need to enter into business with that person again, necessarily. But to not remember it, to not bring it to account. I think like I, I, that's why I like the monetary idea. Like the account doesn't exist anymore. There's no record of your sin in my books. Um, but I need faith to kind of exercise that, to actually practice it. I need I need the results of, of what I believe is true about my forgiveness and God's amazing grace, his, his mercy towards me so that I will actually do this. Um, let's go to then that next verse, verse six. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. And um, I think it was neat how uh, on Sunday night, Pastor James had, had uh, this past Sunday kind of talked about this very same concept about why is this true? And, you know, I think we trip up on it a little bit sometimes, but when we understand it, I think, I guess I would say like a parable, then it it's, easier to really believe this versus true. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, I'll just put it out there. Wh what do you think makes it hard for you to think that Jesus' words would be true? Or do you, do you have no, does it not even seem like, like an issue for you? Is there anything about that verse that you go? Scientifically impossible. Okay, scientifically impossible. <laughs> what else? <laughs> Right. I mean, because it, it seems so, it also seems so self-serving. It's like, why would I, it's like magic almost, right? It's like doing something for the sake of showing that I have greater faith. And so I can levitate now, or I can make, I can, I can heal you, right? Faith healing and things like that. We get nervous about that stuff, right? Is that the work of the spirit? Is it phony? And so we, we, we struggle with this first because maybe we've heard people use it in a way that we think is, is harmful. And maybe a self-help gospel or um, name it and claim it sometimes kind of gets this direction. And I think that we have to we have to think like okay what is the deep understanding of this kind of talk what is jesus emphasizing well remember it's about faith and the faith it doesn't it doesn't really say this in here but the faith has to be in who in god right and what is our belief about what God is able to do, right? And in the context of this, I'm just getting my notes up. So I'm, I'm trying not to be too, um, not trying to stop continually, but I'm kind of stopping in the middle of it. But what, what we want to see is the context of how the faith is not in our own faith. And that's the, that's the thing I think people make this verse about a little bit. Like, well, you don't have enough faith. And that's why you can't do this thing. Well, what would it look like? What, what would it look like if we were trying to exercise our faith? Would it be saying, you know, like, be healed? Is that what 
this verse would be practiced as? I think this verse would be practiced as a prayer to the Lord for him to do what only God can do, right? And that's that's where I think we start kind of like going, oh, now people can do what God can do. That's never the case. God does what God can do, and we have faith in him. We, we exercise a trust in him to do what God can do. And so it's, it's casting it upon him to say, I believe, Lord, that you can help me forgive my neighbor. I believe that you can help me even address an, a friend who sinned because I can't do it. I can't go there. I'm too scared. I'm afraid. I mean, I think what happens is the misapplication is to start thinking this is about mulberry trees and this is about your ability to move them and about mountains. No, it's, it's a figure to say, this is scientifically impossible. This is not possible for you to do. Now God can part the waters of the Red Sea. God could, Jesus as God could take away leprosy. He could cause Peter to walk on water. And that's where the, the, the sermon was about last Sunday night. It was, it was about Peter walking on water. And then he starts looking around and he starts thinking about mulberry trees. He's thinking, well, there's no way I can cast a mulberry tree into the sea, right? So if we start thinking forgiveness and repentance is about my ability to do it, then we're going to always fall short. We're going to repent in a, in a worldly manner. We're going to, we're going to forgive in a worldly manner. And it's not actually going to be God's grace, God's divine power, his Holy Spirit actually doing things in your life. Because only God can cause us to have this attitude of really repenting. I mean, that's a change of heart. That's a change of, of life. So I think these verses are trying to say, look, you can't do it, but continue to have faith in God who can. And what is that faith like? It's, it's, it's like the mustard seed, right? He just kind of, he kind of takes it back to the, the publican who says, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's not, it's not a learned faith, so to speak, by academic scholar uh, type of activity. It's not something that that is like that. It's more of the core of complete trust in God because I know I'm weak, because I know I can't, because I, I'm relying on him. And then see what God can do in your life. See if when you repent and you are dealing with a sin that's a pattern in your life, right? You might refer to it as an addiction. Um, or it may be an addiction. Do you do you completely rely on the promises of God to work in your life, to take the anger away, to take the bitterness away, and to keep praying for it because you know only God can do that in your in your life. So that's that's kind of the nutshell that I think is is important here. But I want to open it up to some of your comments because maybe this has made you think about something that that hasn't been touched on or maybe an issue that you could relate this to? What are some things that you would, you would kind of go along with on this topic? John? Well, it seems like Jesus uh, <clears throat> gave them their request. Yeah, how so? What would you, what do you mean? Well, he said, if you had a you know, lesser seed, you could do this and this. He didn't increase their faith didn't say this is how you increase your faith and uh, it seems like he's I would if, if without any commentary just reading it faith by yourself I would conclude that he said you don't have faith like a must see because you can't do any of these things I mean he what, do you, what so is, is that where you would end with that or where where would you go then coming to that conclusion. I would say, uh, I guess I need to read the rest of the scripture <laughs> <laughs> and compare scripture to scripture. Okay. But, uh, it just seems to me that 
uh, Jesus is not granting their request. How does Jesus grant this request in life? You know, what would you, if, if somebody said, John, how can I, how can I increase my faith? I would say, you may get into some trials <laughs> and, and, and uh, hardships. I yes, think that's what I would say. Part of the question is, how big is our God? Yes. I remember Presbytery meeting 20 years ago, maybe 30, doing a debate on the framework, and an OPC pastor, well-known pastor, talking about creation, he stood up and he said, I don't see how God could have done it in seven days, <laughs> or six days. And I, I mean, I shudder to think of that. But I mean, I can, I still remember in 1970, we had a little baby born in this church. Um, a child was near death. And Sunday evening, congregation went to prayer. And one man said, probably best if that baby dies. That baby lived and still <clears throat> You know, Jesus made the comment, your faith is too small. Do we really believe that God is capable of answering prayer? Kathy. Um, it's, it seems like to me, and I think we've all heard this, that he's not in Jesus' answer, he's not focusing on the amount of faith because he's, well, he is in a sense. He's saying all you need is a mustard seed of faith, but it's all about the object of yeah, faith. Yeah, yeah, Who, yeah. Like you said earlier, we're trusting this big God with our little bit of faith. And so, like John Courtnoven said, it feels like he's not answering it. He's maybe not answering it directly. But he's answering indirectly, and because he is, it is count, the way it's worded. If you had faith and you don't, <laughs> like a mustard seed, you don't. Indeed, you don't. But if you did, then this is what you could ask God to do, because he's a big God, and all you need is a little bit of faith. But at this point. In their lives, very possibly the disciples didn't have even a grain of mustard seed. We know that later in their lives they did. You know, they were willing to give their lives for him. But yeah, and it's not like a bank account. You can't just like say, okay, now I've achieved a level of faith. Faith wavers day by day. I mean, let's be honest. Like some days you're just like running too much on self-assurance and you just don't, you know, and I think, I think you know, what we've said, but, but it's hard to remember is like, the, the faith isn't what makes God strong. It, so don't you, we don't really like keep thinking about, well, how strong is my faith? I got to get my faith down. It's the object, yeah. right? And so we don't have faith in faith, you know? And that's why it can be so small to be directed at the right place. Yeah. Mike and then Debbie. Uh, and later he told them, Whatever you ask in my name, I will do. Pray to the Father, pray through me in my name, I will do it. Subjected to thy will be done, of course. Just kind of along the same lines mm -hmm. as everybody else, but just it almost seems like he's, um, as he often would do with questions like, Redirect or answer the yeah. part of the question, but not what they're actually asking. Yeah. yeah. Like, Give me some more faith. We need more faith. Yeah. And they're like, and he's saying, what your really faith, need? the kind of faith and the quality of your faith and what it's the object of yeah. your faith is the problem. Yeah. If it was that kind of faith, you would only need this little bit to do great things mm -hmm. because it wouldn't be the kind of faith that you're thinking of and asking for. So trying to indirectly direct them to like think different about this, you know? Yeah. 
That's good. I think the next two sections also kind of paint a picture of what faith does and doesn't look like. If you look at the next passage, it's kind of an interesting segue, but if we kind of keep this same kind of thinking, like what is faith in Jesus like? Then I think the next two passages sort of give us illustrations. Let's read the next part. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep to say to him when he's come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink. And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. So to look at this in the right perspective, you know, it it basically suggests that there are some who treat God or treat the Messiah as though they're worthy of whatever, you know, this servant thinks he's worthy of. Right. So he's he's speaking here again, like in this parable, think about how, yeah, it makes all kinds of sense, but he wouldn't be teaching this unless we were acting like these servants who we go out, work a hard day, and we kind of think we ought to be served for a while. Right. And there's that temptation to start to think. What is our relationship with God like? Is it where God ought to satisfy the things I want and need? Should God bless me? Am I worthy of God's blessing? Because look at what I've done for you. Right? And that verse at the end, I think verse 10. So you also, when you've done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. Even if we could do all that we've been commanded, we'd only have done our duty. And we're we're not always that happy with servant language, but it, it was used a lot at that time, right? And a servant was a servant. And you didn't have rights, so to speak, right? You had a duty to do. And you had to perform it. And as God's creation, we were created to do what God created us to do. And if we could have fulfilled that, we we wouldn't have been anything special, (laughs) to be honest. Now, think of where we actually are, right? We're fallen. And we don't keep God's commands. We're still accountable for those. Mm -hmm. But what's kind of the joke is that we break them all and we we fall short. But then as we kind of feel a little accomplishment in the Christian faith, we start going, I wonder if I'm like David. I wonder if God thinks of me like David. I wonder if I'm like after his own heart. You know, yeah, I've sinned a bit. I'm a little, and that's why I feel kind of good about myself because I'm like, yeah, you know, God. Or, you know, like, do you ever do that? Do you ever think, because I'm, I'm speaking from experience. Sometimes I'm like, man, you know, I kind of done something. (laughs) Is that what our faith is like? God, hear my prayer. Because you said the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Am I willing to put myself there? Do I feel like, you know, I'm in a good spot to pray now because... I've been hitting my devotions pretty regularly. <laughs> oh, man. It's self-righteousness. That's what's going on here. Is our faith like that? Do we think our faith in God is a little bit like, I'm getting it now. And God will now hear my prayer. God will answer my prayer. I could, I could walk on water. Don't we feel that way? Like, I think that's, you know, Peter was feeling like, I can walk on water. Command me to come out, Jesus, and I'll do it. And his faith was starting to get kind of cocky. Right? He was getting to a point where he needed to realize what his faith was in. 
It couldn't be in his own faith. It couldn't be in his own accomplishment. It couldn't be in, I'm a disciple. That could be tempting, right? To feel some kind of honor for what we've done. And so there's a little point here, I think, where Jesus gets into saying, do we describe ourselves as unworthy? Do we think God owes us anything? And I definitely think Jesus is, is looking at the, the landscape of the Jewish culture that he's in, Pharisees and, and teachers of the law, kind of building up a way to physically, humanly keep God's law, right? That, that one person coming to Jesus asking, what do I need to be saved? Jesus tells him, and he goes, all this I've done. Like there was a system in place for people to really think if I could keep the letter of the law, like the Pharisees do, I've got something to be proud of. And that kind of faith is a self-righteous faith that's deadly because it's, it's not seeing ourselves as unworthy of needing repentance, of needing to be humble before God. Um, wanted to... Um, I won't I won't read the quote, but Martin Luther has a, a neat quote about him preaching grace. He says, I've been preaching grace for 20 years now, but I constantly find myself proud of my accomplishments before God. And I have to see him as rags of filthy rags that have no... <clears throat> deserving or merit of God's grace. And I thought, how, how appropriate, right? Because Martin Luther did some very difficult things to stand for God's grace, but he was also examining himself enough to see that the way of the Catholic church is the way of all of our hearts. The way of the Pharisee is the way of all of our hearts. It's, it's a very common thing that we will do if left to ourselves. We'll, we'll make anything uh, like that. Any comments as you've kind of, I've kind of been pushing through it, but I sort of wanted to kind of keep the momentum from before. Dick? This just follows hopefully along what you're trying to say is the object of our faith. But the first reading that part about the mulberry tree, uh, it, just made me think of Simon the Sorcerer, right? Simon the Sorcerer was doing really interesting and amazing things and just to get some kudos from the people, just to get the people's amazement, right? So he was kind of, uh, it, it was all an ego booster thing. And then when he became a believer, even then, when he saw Peter laying hands on people and giving the Holy Spirit, he wanted that power. And it wasn't for God's purpose, it was for his. So, so you know, as... Believers, we I think the real faith is not in doing something amazing. The real faith is in accepting our humble position of servants. You know, Peter actually says mm -hmm. uh, in, in First Peter five, he says, "Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that He may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith." That's what our faith is for. Our faith is so. I mean, let me move it this way. What's the purpose of leaders in the church, you know, elders and deacons and stuff like that? The purpose is to be servants, humble servants, right? And so when uh, well, I'll just confess my guilt because it's the easiest. Um, <laughs> when I have an opinion, I'm convinced it's right, and I don't understand why you guys don't agree with me and and uh so sometimes i'm maybe a bit more vocal about my opinion i should be both in the church and at work and everywhere right but well, you gotta realize wait a second yeah you gotta be careful or you really gotta be careful at church because we are god's servants and that's what we're here for that's what our purpose is our purpose is not to get our way our purpose is to be a servant of the almighty god and that's what faith helps us do because we can't do it on our own. I know I can't do it on my own. Wow, that's so good. I, I like that because 
that's really where we need to go with this in terms of that. Uh, the next passage I was going to read is just one verse where Jesus talks about that in chapter 22, uh, verse 27. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. And I think that's what Dick is saying. Dick is saying, what is the purpose? We are here to be God's servants. And we've been so bad at it that God himself had to become a man and be the servant in our place. That's, that's how God's active, Jesus' active obedience like he didn't just need to come and live a perfect life. He came to be a servant. So he didn't just come and, you know, like live a middle-class life and just not sin. No, no, no. He put on an apron and he washed people's feet. He had pity on the leper. He, he humbled himself, right? And he did that to fulfill what you and I, are supposed to be doing, but we haven't done. And so it sort of like puts a dagger in our pride because we we don't think, well, my my object is to be assertive. My object, I would rather be like, well, I'm just supposed to be obedient to God. But you know, he doesn't just say be obedient to me. He's like, consider others as good as yourself. In fact, Put someone else's need ahead of your own. That's a servant, right? So I'm supposed to view it exactly as, as Dick said. Like that is the highest form of obedience to God is when I serve others. And not go in and think, okay, who can bring me some water here? You know, like, right? And that is where we are just... <laughs> reminded what our Christian purpose is, is to serve. And Jesus does it, and we sometimes miss it. We sometimes don't realize how impactful all of those things were, but he's doing that to show us what we have failed to do, right? He says that when he washes the disciples' feet. He's like, no one did that for me. You know, and then the time when oil is being put on him. Right. And he's like, you never asked to wash my feet. You never gave me something to. But this woman is doing it. And what's what she's doing will be told. Today for uh, forever, because that is like that's faith. That's the active faith that we're called to do. But we're 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 trying to make it some super power where we can do amazing things. And it's like, well. You know, you could exercise your faith in being a servant. So it it's powerful stuff that that is so uh, humbling for us to to digest. I think what's even more humbling is the fact that Isaiah says that God calls the ravenous bird from the east and the man to execute his will from the far country. He's already determined it. Um, C.S. Lewis made a, uh, one of his quotes is that uh, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because the, I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, day and night. I pray in my sleeping. It doesn't change God. It changes me. Yeah, there's there's a lot to learn. Yeah. I'm thinking in light of what you've been sharing and what Dick said, maybe I'm the mulberry tree that needs to be uprooted hmm. in my pride, you know, my lack of keeping my eyes fixed on Jesus. Yeah, keep keep pondering it. You know, try to uh, see how it will apply into your life as you go through things. See if, you know, 
if you can see God's kingdom while we're doing our work, while we're parenting, while we're grandparenting, while we're neighbors, you know, see how this is happening in our lives. Uh, the next, the next section, we'll just start going into it. It can, it can kind of apply the same way. If you, if you keep these layers going with gratitude and ingratitude on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith, your faith has made you well. And um, that's where I think that continuity keeps going. We're learning about faith. What does faith do when you're healed and cleansed? Um, I remember one time I messed up pretty bad and my I was telling my dad about it and uh, he said you know the question might be you know you you can ask for forgiveness of this but what will you do now what will you do after this and what I kind of think relates to this is you know this you're cleansed of leprosy and you've just been given a new life right what impact will that have and and that will show that will show where your faith and what your faith is in and what what you wanted in the first place you know what did they want from jesus did they just want to get out of leprosy which i mean this is not a small thing <laughs> this is huge right there's a lot of spiritual meaning with leprosy because it's a picture of sin and it's a picture of just it's not curable at that time there's no way to be you know, you're unclean, you're an outcast. You, So we, all these effects of, of sin are sort of personified in leprosy. So you get rid of that. But do you want more than that? Right? Do you want, or is it just like, hey, I just, I want to get rid of this feeling of guilt or I want to get rid of the problems in my life. Is that what faith in God is? Is it, I want to get rid of, all the things that are a problem for me or is faith in God transformative where you are now humbly amazed and praising God for what he's done. And I think that that's kind of how you can carry on the, the previous parable to this example where Luke is saying, so if faith doesn't look like, the servant who's worthy of being served, what does it look like? It, it looks like this man who, who cried out for mercy and he's told, go show yourself. And so there's some faith in that piece, right? Because uh, according to the narrative, it's not like, oh, I'm cleansed. Now I'll go to the priest. It's like, well, I don't know why I'm going to the priest, you know, but I guess I'll do it. And as they're walking, as they're going, they realize Jesus has healed them. Uh, so there's kind of a, a active faith in trusting God along the way. And then when it happens, what is the impact on your life? Because now we find out what their faith really is, right? Sometimes I think of the, the seed that was planted that grew up quickly. It's like, yes, I believe. But then these other things come along the way. And now it's like, ah, but now something new is more important to me. Right? Now that I don't have leprosy, I need to get a better job. And I got to start making some money. And I'm going to 
oh, I'm going to take care of all that. It's, it's like the guy who got out of that huge debt. He's like, cool, now I'm free and clear. I'm going to go get what's owed to me. And now I'm going to be, right? So it's like, is that what faith in God is like? No, it's not. Faith in God worships God. It loves God. It wants to be, he goes right back to Jesus and falls on his face. I think if, if you've, I hope that maybe you've had an experience like this where something, a blessing of God hits you where you just like, emotionally, it's just, I got to stop everything I'm doing. Lord, thank you. I didn't deserve I hope you've experienced that where you've, instead of just going on your way, you decided, no, I'm going to stop and praise God because I love him. I love God. And I, I, it's not because of anything in me. It's just, I'm, I'm a child who God put his love on. He forgave me of my sins. He's given me, you guys, I have a pastor. I have, you know, we're living in LA and it's driving us nuts, but we're going to get to fellowship with believers and go, God reigns. He saved us by grace. We're going to heaven. We're going to be, there's going to be multitudes Casting their crowns in the sea, casting them to God, saying, This is not my crown, this is you. We're gonna see the, the lamb who was slain. And we're gonna go to Jesus. We're gonna see him face to face. And that's that's what we want to live out, right? Isn't that that's faith? It's small. And I hope, you know, maybe, maybe like you said, we're going to go through some trials. That's, you can't, how else do you get faith, right? It's, it's like kind of getting chopped down farther and farther where you finally go, Lord have mercy. That's faith. It's not self-righteousness. And I'm so glad because that's, mm -hmm. that's where we, we can't stand before God. But if we simply trust him and and pray he he will he will hear us let's pray lord have mercy on us yes. we continually try to bring something of our own before you that we think makes us worthy <clears throat> forgive us of that forgive us for all those petty things that we're proud of thinking of course you love us Forgive us for trying to be self-righteous. Uh, cleanse us from that. Heal us from that. Uh, we repent of that. We thank you for Christ's righteousness. It is all given to us. And so as we have been forgiven, teach us, help us to forgive. As we have received uh, so many uh, blessings, Help us to serve, to serve. Thank you uh, for these things that we can learn, but we pray that you'd apply them to our lives. Give us your spirit to apply it in the here and now, in our daily walk with you and with each other. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, Greg. Good to see you. I'm going to end the meeting. I'm going to end the Recording first.